All right, so what I'm going to do is going to be a little tiny bit different. So um, I got to say I was so impressed by Hema earlier today, um, particularly her dad and the advice that her dad gave her. And, um, you know, he gave her one book and told her to focus on one thing. And um, for people that don't know me, um, I've been doing this for basically since 2001. My dad always joked that, you know, I got in at the perfect time, you know, when the market was crashing. And, um, you know, I, I, I've been up, I've been down, you know, I can't say that I was ever a floor trader. You know, I've worked with actually many floor traders in, in my last six to seven years and what I've been doing. And, you know, I worked for one of the big financial advisory firms and realized it was really nothing like I thought it was. So I, I really started just like everybody else here. And I think that was very humbling. And as I mentioned before, the last six years, what I've done is I've, I've really helped and coached and mentored students in learning how to trade. And one of the things that I found was kind of the most kind of eye opening for me was people take things that are that is very, very simple and make it very, very complicated. So I'm sure many of you have heard this, but can anybody type in chat? Does anybody know what the acronym KISS stands for? And I don't mean like, you know, your significant other. I'm sure a couple people know, know what it is. Go ahead and type it in there. I won't say it, but I'm sure that you guys can. Um, but what I found is the, the more simple you keep things, the better off people typically make things. Now, let me ask a quick question real fast before I jump into the disclosures here, because of course we have to have the disclosures. Um, on a one to five scale, one being you're a brand new beginner, You've never done this before, but you really like the idea of trading, or maybe you've kind of sim trade a little bit, versus a number five, which is I'm an experienced trader. This is all I do. I'm full time. My entire living comes from trading. Where would you rank yourself? And go ahead and type that in chat so I can kind of get an idea of kind of how advanced people are inside of the room because I can kind of custom tailor it for that. <laughs> Got some fives right off the bat. Five, 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 five right off there. And then we dropped into some threes and a little bit lower ones here. Uh, okay, I see a very demanding day job trade on the side. Okay, so it looks like we don't have a whole lot of brand new beginners in here. Um, we have a lot of threes in the room. I'd say that's the uh, majority of people that, you know, and again, a three year old, uh, a three on here would be kind of a, I'm trading, I'm making some money, but it's not my full time job. So I'm going to kind of tailor it towards that. So before I jump in any farther, let me jump into the actual disclosure aspect of it. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard these before. Um, it's nothing new. Uh, one of the biggest things is, you know, past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Uh, with all trading, there's, uh, you know, risk of loss. Uh, without without risk, there would be no reward. Uh, you know, otherwise it would just be called shopping. Um, you'd back, you know, the cart up and get a, you know, basket full of money, and that'd be nice. But that's not really what the world's about. Um, one of the big things too that, you know, there are no guarantees with this. Um, I think that's important, and I'm going to cover that a little bit later, but. Anybody that says a system is guaranteed to work 100% of the time is really not giving you the truth. You know, um, if you think about kind of the big winners and big losers in the industry, it doesn't matter if it's Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan. They lose sometimes as well. Um, now, again, having their money, it makes it a lot harder for them to lose, but they get surprised every now and then as well. Um, there's no perfect mentality whatsoever. So for me, what I'm going to do, and, and my goal for the next basically 45 minutes, is I want to give you, for your experienced traders, I want to give you a very simple strategy that's going to add another arrow to your quiver. Now, I highly doubt anybody would have any problems having a simple strategy that make a little bit extra money next week. And for the beginners, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you something that's very, very simple to trade. Okay, I'll give you an opportunity to get the indicator to have it help you with it. But the most important thing is I want you to focus on a very finite bit of data. Okay, I think it's great that a lot of the uh, speakers today have really focused on that indicators will work for everything out there. But I want to give you something very, very specific so you can focus on that and make money as fast as possible. All right. So with that being said, the agenda today is I'm going to go over some trading misconceptions. And I feel that trading misconceptions are important because when you understand kind of someone's mentality of what they're thinking or what their beliefs are, it's a lot easier to help mentor them and kind of point them in the right direction for what they should be doing versus what they think they're doing. All right. Um, <laughs> yes, Helen. I'm sorry. I do speak a little bit quick. Um, I'm actually an East Coaster, if you couldn't tell, DC. And I grew up outside of Philadelphia. Um, and I worked in New York City for about three years, four years. And uh, unfortunately, I'm so passionate about this, but I will do my best to slow down. So if I get quick, do me a favor, just yell at me in the chat, and I'll slow down. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the misconceptions, but then I'll also give you the step-by-step -step strategy and then the easy rules to follow. Like I said, the point of today is to make this as simple and as fast as possible, and I'll actually show you the grid that we use on Think or Swim. <laughs> go over an A. Yeah. All right. So. Let's cover the trading misconceptions. Now, the first one is pretty interesting, and the first time I heard this, I really had to break down and think about it, and it's you can never go broke taking a profit, and a lot of people think, well, that's great. That's absolutely true, but it's not, and one of the biggest things that I feel is important that people get about trading is you have to understand that money management is the most important thing. Um, you know, you could take a little bit of profit and a little bit of profit and a little bit of profit. The problem is 
if you have too much risk in a trade and all of a sudden you take a loser, which can happen for any given reason in the world, you've just wiped out. You've had an attaboy, 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 and then boom, everything is gone and then some. So unfortunately, trading is more about just profit. It's more about protecting what you have. Okay. Now the second one is trading is easy or a get rich scheme. Now it's funny, in another webinar I heard somebody say, oh, it's not a get rich scheme, it's a, it's a get broke you know, quick scheme. Um, and it can be. When you don't know what you're doing in anything in life, you can lose money real quick. Um, and trading is just like that. Trading is something that you need to work at. You know, none of us are actually born traders. You know, we don't come out of the womb saying, you know, buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. As much as we feel that we are, that's not really the case. You know, market psychology comes to this in a whole lot. I mean, human beings are not designed to trade. I mean, trading can be very stressful if you let it be. And, you know, advice when I was first given when I, when I first started trading was the day that you realize you've made it as a trader is the day that you don't care whether you win or you lose. And the longer the longer that I've been doing this, and the longer I've been working with students, um, the more that's kind of set into me. When you don't have an emotional kind of connection to things, um, that's when trading becomes an actual job and not just a hobby or, or something to you know kind of get that adrenaline going. Um, the next one is you know people are out there looking for the holy grail of indicators, and you can say, wait a second, I've seen you know six holy grail indicators already today. Um, and that's true, you know, there's a lot of great information that was given today as well as the one that I'm going to talk about today, but there's no such thing that works 100% of the time. You know, the markets are always changing, things work, things don't work. The important thing is that you stay consistent in what you're doing. You know, if you're constantly changing things and constantly testing new things, you're never going to gain any ground, you're never going to gain any consistency. You know, I've seen two different people trade the same exact strategy and one person's successful with it, but the other person's not. And when you sit down side by side and you break them down, it's always easy to figure out which one is following the rules and which one's not. Even if they think they are, you can always find that one person that's either added secret sauce or kind of changed it here or added another bit to it. And what they're doing is they're seeking this holy grail, something that can do it for them, and unfortunately that's not how trading works. Now another one we hear a lot of times is trade small, trade often. And people think just because I'm trading small amounts that it's not going to be a big deal because my losses will be small as well. But one thing you have to worry about, and this is with any business, is what is the cost of doing business? You know, there's many different brokerage firms out there. Um, one of the, you know, two of the biggest ones we've seen today are TradeStation and Thinkorswim. And they're both great brokerage firms. You know, I have my personal preference. I, I love the charting at TradeStation, but one of the cons for TradeStation is it's not necessarily the cheapest guy in the world. You know, and then the flip side, you go to some of the other brokerage firms that are super cheap, but then they have no charting and you're kind of just guessing. So, you know, Thinkorswim is the one that we use at uh, Major League Trading because it gives the best of both worlds. But here's the thing, trade small, trade often. If you're paying a lot in commissions, and say commissions are 30 to 40 percent of your gains, you're giving so so much money back. Instead of finding and waiting till that you get that one good trade a day or two good trades a day, that's all you need to hit your profits, and then go do something else because life is more important than sitting in front of a computer screen all day. And again, that's why I want to keep today simple. Now, the last trading misconception that we hear all the time is that news matters. Now, how many? I'm sure there's somebody sitting there going, "Hey, no, no, news matters. News matters." How many news traders are in the room? Go ahead and type a yes inside of the uh, inside of the chat. Now, you are correct, news can move the markets, but most of the time, news is just acting as a catalyst. Now, what I mean by that is, price was moving in a particular direction already, and what happens is, news comes out, news shoots it, and it goes exactly where you thought it was going to go. Now, here's the problem with that. How many people believe that when news is released, you get it the same exact time as all the banks and institutions out there? Does anybody believe that? No, absolutely not. They always have the data, and, you, and, and, and proof of this is just literally watch a news release. If you start watching the trade 10, you know, look at a chart 10, 15 minutes beforehand, just look at it. It starts moving before the news even comes out, and what happens? It always drives to a specific point and then kind of stops, and it just dead ends right there. It literally goes flat right before the news. You know why? Because the banks and institutions know what people are going to be looking at. So what happens is they bring the price to where they need it to be to take those buy and sell orders, because remember, if you're going to buy something in the market, what does somebody else have to be doing? They have to be selling, right? So what happens a lot of times is you'll have that person go in there. You guys think that, oh, my God, the number was good. Here it goes. It's going to go up. You buy. And what happens? It goes straight down, doesn't it? Why? Because the big guys already knew what direction it was. They know what you want to do with it. Bad news, it's going down. Good news, it's going up. And then it does the exact opposite, okay? And then as soon as you get in and it goes down, guess what you have to do? Oh, my God, I lost money. What do you do with the trade? You sell it, right? So when you sell it, who's on the other end buying it from you? The big guys, right? And it shoots right back up again and goes exactly where you thought it was going to go to. It's just a play on emotions. you know. So at the end of the day, the news doesn't necessarily matter. It's the market psychology out there. 
All right. So in understanding these different things about taking profit in the holy grail of indicators, I mean, understand trading is trading. You're going to lose money once or, you know, every so often. And that's not a bad thing. And when you look at the actual results of the big banks, they actually lose more than they win. The difference is when they win, they win real, real big. And that's what, as a trader, we have to focus on. Now, one thing that I think is pretty interesting today is a lot of people talk today, and this really, really surprised me. They talk today about how it's us versus Wall Street. And in my honest opinion, I mean, they're all very, very smart individuals, but it's not us versus Wall Street because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good I am. Am I ever going to beat Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan? No. They have a whole heck of a lot more money than I have. And if Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan hits buy or sell, it's going exactly where they want it to go. That's just the way that it is. What I'm supposed to be doing is when I'm in the market, my job is not to take money from Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan or Bank of America. It's to take it from people that don't know what they're doing because there's plenty of people out there in the markets that don't know or don't care about what's happening in the markets and aren't taking it seriously as a job. So you're, if you're in this to make serious money, what you have to do is you have to figure out how to take the money from them before Bank of America and Goldman Sachs and those guys take it from them. The strategy we're going to show you right now um, it is meant to do that. It's meant to help you and kind of figure out what not only what they're doing, but what other people are thinking. All right. So as Jeanette mentioned, divergence is something a few different people have talked about today. And whenever I see divergence, the first thing I do is I get, you know, I start to cringe because I've seen so many people use divergent incorrectly. Now, the whole point of using and trading divergence is because you want to find a trend reversal. And I'm sure everybody in here can agree with me. If you can get in early on a trend reversal, it's highly probable. You know why? Because as soon as you see that thing change, everybody else is seeing a change, and then they're jumping on. But guess who's already in? The big guys, right? They want you to jump on because when you're jumping on, you're pushing price higher, and then they're selling it, and they're taking their profit out, and then you're left holding the trade still. It's what's happened in all the market crashes. Um, it just happens again and again. And the problem with divergence is a lot of people are using you know, oscillator indicators. And again, there's nothing wrong with them, but they can be difficult to read, particularly you know, if you're not a five on this you know, in, in your trading skills. I'm sure oscillators are kind of you know difficult for you to read sometimes. And again, in the past six years, mentoring students and things how to you know how to trade and, and, and deal with the markets. The biggest problem that we have is when they, they, they put too many you know indicators on the screen and they're not re you're not they're not only reading them incorrectly, but they're also using them incorrectly. And Hema did a great job of talking about people using indicators wrong earlier. You know the common ones are RSI. You'll see stochastics, money flow index, MACD. And again, it was, it was funny. Um, I did some speaking for a company a few years ago. And I used to, you know, ask people, what, what's your favorite indicator? You know, what, what, you know, what do you use? And everybody had to say MACD because that's when MACD was really, really hot. And uh, I used to ask people, you know, it's like, well, what does it stand for? And I'd have 90% of the room, most times almost 95% of the room, have no clue what it even stood for. I asked them to write it down on a piece of paper and nobody ever got it correctly. And then I would ask them, well, what, what's used to build it? Do you know, what, you know, do you know what's in there? You know, how, how do they build the indicator? Because, you know, these indicators are built, and it's so common. And I would never get anybody that could actually tell me how the indicator was actually built. And it was kind of funny. I was like, you're using something that you don't fully understand. And does that seem like it's a good, you know, use of your time? And um, unfortunately, <laughs> more times than not, it wasn't. All right. So classical divergence is something many people have covered, as I mentioned today. But what I'm going to do is we're going to use the same concept divergence, but then actually bring it back down and make it a little bit more simple. Okay, ours is a very simple three, you know, three part setup. I'll give you the entry and then exit criteria. And the fun part about this is the exit is actually kind of based off of your experience. All right. So let me dive into it here. So what is MLT divergence? You know, what do I mean by this? You know, are you going to show me a lot of indicators? You're going to show me charts? And I'm actually not. I'm going to make this very, very simple. Okay, if we have two different uh, assets going, you know, in the upper direction, and again, A, let's say is stock A and B is stock B, and they're both going up, correct? This is kind of like those, uh, if you guys have ever been to a diner or like a little kid's, um, like I have seven-year-old twin boys, and they love those games where there's two pictures and you have to circle what's missing or what's different. That's what I'm going to talk about. So when prices are moving up, things go to a new high. And as we all know, this is the impulse move in the stock, right? All of a sudden, when price goes back down again, we've created a high, and now we have what's called, sorry, guys, jaw pop there, I uh I do jujitsu on the side as kind of a, a hobby, and I took a knee to the uh, the chin today, and unfortunately my one side keeps popping on me. So we have impulse and we have correction or retracement. Adrian, that's you know that's one of the things, but impulse, um, it, it, you know, impulse and correction tends to be the two terms that most people use. But A and B are both doing the same exact thing. And again, no nothing out of the ordinary. This looks just like every single day. Then all of a sudden, A goes to a new high for the day, and B unfortunately doesn't. Now. My seven-year-olds, if I gave them this diagram and asked them to circle what's different, would they be able to figure it out? 
Absolutely. Stock B did not create a new high. Now, this is suddenly becoming divergent. Okay, and this is what I want to focus on today. All right. Now, here's the setup that we're looking for. Okay, there are four main indexes that people look at. And I'm sure you guys could type them if you wanted to, but you have the S&P 500, right? You have the Dow, you have the Russell, and what's the fourth one? Does anybody know? I'll give you guys a sec. I'm sure you can figure it out. Like I said, I told you I wanted to be very, 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 you know, simple. Yep, there you go. NQ, you got it. The NASDAQ, absolutely. Great job, guys. So those are the four main ones. And again, every single trader is looking at those. It doesn't matter if you're a stock trader, a futures trader, an options trader, even currencies. I'm, I'm, I'd say I'm primarily a currencies trader, and I still look at those four to get direction for the day. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at those four. Now, most times during the day, you're going to have three or four of those that are all going up. You're always going to have a retrace or going down, and then you're going to have a retracement in one of them. And what we're going to do is we want to find the moment when one of them is not doing the same thing that the rest of them are. Typically, it's going to be one, but sometimes there's a situation where you'll have two making new highs, but there's two not making a new high, or vice versa, two making new lows for the day, but two of them are holding, and they're not going to their lows. And that's exactly when we want to find these trades. Now, these trade setups happen typically four to five times a week. Now, this is a strategy that was designed by Eric. I did not design it, but it's something that I've been fascinated with since he showed it to me. All right? Now, what we're going to do is this is going to be done on a five-minute candlestick chart. Now, I know some of you said that you're very, very busy and things like that, and, and, and I get that. This is not a swing trade strategy. This is not a long-term strategy, and you could use the same – you know, you could use the same information, but today I just want to give you a quick, simple strategy you can use next week, even on Monday, all right? Now, you can use it on really with any different asset class. Um, you know, there's stock traders out there, and me personally, once I learned options, I never went back to the actual stock market again. Um, I'll use, you know, ETS, but most of the time I'll do options on indexes. Uh, futures is what a lot of the MLT traders tra use this for. And then binary options is also something that we're also incorporating to what we do. Um, a lot of people want low entry and, you know, unfortunately with the day trade stock rules and futures, um, we're finding that binary options for a lot of beginner traders is, is really a nice way to go. Now, when would you get into these trades? It's very simple, and I'll explain what the entry bar is or the signal bar is in one minute. Um, but it's basically one tick above, so it's very, very simple. I'm going to show you what the signal bar is. When it goes one tick above, you get in. All right? So here's a chart. So basically what, what's happening is here, and the steps of this are very, very simple. Okay? When we start off, we're going to bring our four charts up. In this case, it's futures. You could use, you know, you could use SPY, and I'll show you some charts later with the ETFs involved here. All right? Now, you'll notice over here at where the dotted lines are is approximately about 1130 in the morning. And you'll see that that's where everybody's hitting their, their highs for the day. But what we'll do is if you look over where the lows are later on around eh, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you will notice that two of the different um, indexes, the ES and the Russell, right, they are actually breaking through the lows for the day. But if you look on the right-hand side of the chart and you're looking at, you know, the NASDAQ and the Dow, they are not. They held. So at this point, this is what we would call a two-by-two two divergence. Now, some people are probably like, wait a second, I'm a little bit confused here. Keep it very, very simple. If you mark off the highs and lows for the day, okay, all of a sudden, two charts don't look like the other two. You may say, this is just way too simple for it to work. And that's what I thought as well the first time, too. I was a little bit skeptical. But then when I really dove down on it and I was looking, it's like, wait a second, I can start seeing that. All right? It took me less than one week to start being able to recognize these without any indicators, without any lines on a chart. And that's when things really started to make a difference for me. Okay? Now, here's the setup. Step one. And write these down, please, guys. You're here all day. Like I said, I want you to be able to go back and actually trade this Monday without watching a whole lot of information. What you're looking for is the high, I'm sorry, the open, the high, the low, and the previous close. And literally, just start marking them off on your charts. Put horizontal lines. It doesn't matter what platform you're using. Um, like I said, we prefer Thinkorswim. And if, you know, one of the nice things about Thinkorswim is you can actually open up uh, a demo account with that one. You know, TradeStation is a great platform, but if you don't have it, they unfortunately don't let you uh, get a free trial of it without putting any money in there. But think or swim, you can, you're more, well, more than welcome to go ahead and do that. So very, very simple first step. You guys shouldn't have any problems with this. Open, high, low, close. Okay? In this case, it's, there you go. Is, that, is it showing again? Uh, yep. I see uh, your uh, PowerPoint uh, left and then your one slide, so just maximize, I guess. There we go. Be set. Sorry. Rock and roll. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, guys. I'm, I'm, I was mid-sentence, and all of a sudden I hear this loud popping noise, and all the power just cuts off. So I don't know if uh, something happened up the street or what it was, but that was kind of weird. I've been here all day and no problems, and then all of a sudden, boom, I'm in the middle of talking, and it goes out on me. So, All right. So we were just talking about the high, low, the open, and the close, and mapping those things out. Um, I believe this is the slide that I was on before. And again, this is very simple. We're marking off the open each day, and this is about 11 a.m. in the morning. 
And what you'll notice in this case, it's a two by two, meaning that two of the assets are actually at a higher low, and the other two are, <laughs> actually it could have been a squirrel. <laughs> I actually have a raccoon the other day that was visiting us, so it could be. Um, so what we're looking for here is, uh, you know, the big thing is where is the divergent aspect of this, of this trade? Um, and I'll speed it up a little bit for you guys. In this case, um, we have our highs, we have our lows, and then the white box on NQ is really kind of where we're starting to get divergence. And, you know, in this case, the S&P 500 is close, but if you look at NQ, it's definitely the one that, you know, again, that my seven-year-olds could pick out and say there's something different here. Um, yeah, actually, that's a great question. So I don't use just the high and the low of the day. I actually use what's on the screen. Um, it tends to work better because it's in the near term. Um, being obviously five minute charts, if it's you know 11 o'clock in the morning, um, it doesn't seem like it works as well. So what we found here when we look back is whatever's on the screen is what we use because it's the most recent. So in this case, you'll notice that you know these, these are kind of right around the opening. Uh, but there's also some pre-market movement in there. So what I would say is use whatever's on your screen and, and that, that tends to work what's best. Um, you're always going to, great question, what time frame? Um, we're always going to use the five minute time frame no matter what. Um, it has been tested and the strategy does work on larger time frames, but um, to keep things simple for people, what we say is really start focusing on the five minute first. Um, it gives you a lot more trading opportunities. Um, when people are using larger time frames, because the day is only so many hours long, uh, you know, for these four different assets that you're using, people tend to miss a lot of trades when they focus on the larger time frames. So I know some people that work during the day, this may be a little bit difficult. Um, but try to focus on those first. Again, and I'll give you some more reason you know, why later on. So step two is identify key support and resistance based off the last three days. Now, this is not only for entry, but it's more for exit. Um, one of the biggest things you don't want to do is if you're coming into a, an area where there's you know, a lot of resistance, okay, you don't necessarily want to be buying or selling, or you, know, you don't want to be buying into a large resistance area or vice versa, selling right into a large support area. Things tend to bounce like that. And that's, you know, the reason why that is is very simple. If you can see it, so can everybody else. Uh, why is there a dotted line at 11? I was just using 11 to show the, the same time frame in all four of them. Uh, pit sessions or 24. Um, actually, Hank, you can use 24-7, but we find that the volatility really drains up post hours, or, you know, post market hours. So it's one of those things that you really, I'd say most of the time we find these trades literally between 10 and 12. Um, we have some people that will log in just at noon to try to catch them, and they probably catch two to three a week. Um, but most of the traders find that they're, they're finding between, if you took just literally from 10 to 12, I'd say four out of five days uh, out of the week is when you're finding these trades in that, in that time period. And they're typically pretty quick too. Um, I'll talk about exits in a second. To identify and predict the early trend. Yeah, yep, okay. All right, so in this case, it's the same thing. Um, Actually, this is the one where we, it's the bottom divergence. All right, so this is where the Russell is obviously way well below, okay? This is what's called a one by three, and I don't have time to go into it today, but uh, on the website, we actually go into the two different, a, some people will say, what's well, a three by one versus a one by three? And it sounds confusing, but there's different times you want to use it. So this would be a one by three um, in, in this case, and what, all I want you to be able to do is I don't want you to figure out the strategy yet. I haven't given you the entry rule for it. I want you to look and, and determine where the divergence is. I want you to start seeing it. Anybody have a problem seeing this one? You know, if you look at the dotted line, it's at 11 o'clock. And again, if you look throughout the rest of the day, what is the what is the Russell doing? The Russell is basically staying and is making new lows and staying near the lows of the day. But yet all three other indexes, what are they doing? They're going up, they're going up, they're going up, and they're making new highs on the day. Now, a lot of people talk about market correlations and, well, doesn't all, don't all the markets go in the same direction at the same time? And unfortunately, that's not the case in this in this matter. All right, so let's get into the actual step three of how you're getting into the actual trades, and it should make a lot more sense. Yeah, it's Eastern time. Yeah, everything we do is Eastern time. Um, so the simple, the setup is simple. Like I said, I mentioned that there's one by threes and three by ones and two by twos, but I want you guys to focus on when you have three charts doing the same exact thing and one chart is not. Basically, when when three of them are making a new high and the fourth is not, or three of them are making a new low and the fourth one is not, all right? So in this case, let's go back to the kind of the simple drawing again. All right, so let's say that the price is going down, all right? The lowest low in that kind of movement would be the bottom green bar here, all right? That is the actual signal bar. Now, what is the entry? What did I say from the very beginning? It's one tick above or below the signal bar. So in this case, we've drawn a black dotted line, okay? The bottom green one is the signal line, I'm sorry, the signal bar. The second it breaks that black line, there's your entry. Now, there's no fancy indicator to look at. There's no, you know, 
you know, like I said, some people like three, four, five, six, seven indicators. It's as simple as this. I told you I wanted to keep it simple. It's one tick above that bar. Okay. Anybody have any questions about that one? Because that'll come up later on, I'm sure. If you do, just go ahead and type it in the chat, and I want to make sure that we keep moving along here. All right. So. What does it look like? Here we go. Four charts again. And at first, if you look at this, you guys are going to say, okay, where's the divergence? Where's the divergence? Where's the divergence? I don't see it yet. Well, if you look at the IWM, which again, now I've switched over to ETFs, you'll notice that at 320, the Russell now is making lows for the day. But if you look at the Qs, the Spies, or even the Diamonds, what are they doing? They're not necessarily as low, right? What does that tell you? Looks like they're a little bit stronger for the day. So in this case, this would be a one by three setup. Okay, so what we're doing is we're saying it. Yes, there is divergence, and where would the setup be? So let's talk about IWM. In the bottom, I've marked off with the white line exactly where the divergence occurs. So, where would the where would be the where would the entry be? Well, it's pretty simple. The white line is going through. Okay, it's at 13.20. The break above that candle. There's your entry. Now you say, well, where's your stop? How much risk am I taking? Well, that's very easy as well, and that's what the signal bar is for. The signal bar, again, is that candle, all right? The entry is one tick above. The stop is the entire candle. The second it breaks down and touches, you know, one past the candle, you get out. So what it does is it keeps it very, very, very low, all right? The risk. The weakest would try to catch up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guys are starting to get it. So I'm looking at the questions. Um, which bar would you please? Your mouth is touching. Oh, sorry. T, can you hear me a little bit better now? I'm sorry. There you go. I tried to mark it off for you. In this case, this should be a little bit easier. Okay, see at 11.40, I've circled it down there. The bottom green is the signal bar. You guys see the lowest, the lowest candle in there? I've circled it in the bottom left-hand corner. That is actually your entrance bar. Now, here's where the trade works out really, really well. So everybody else is a little bit higher on the day. If you look at the top left, SPY, didn't come as low at 11.40. Okay? It was definitely not the lows of the day. If you look at the Qs, it's the same thing. It wasn't the lows of the day. The Diamonds, the same thing. It was not the low of the day at 11.40. But if you look at 11.40 on IWM, it's absolutely the low of the day for that. Okay? So what happened is that gave us the low, and as soon as it breaks above that low with a confirmed green up, we enter. Okay? Now, if you notice, it rallied the entire rest of the day. And in fact, one of the differences here if you look at the other three charts, the SPY, the QQQ, and the DIA, they did not make highs until much, much later in the day. So the weakest, the weakest of the four, okay, the Russell, that has the low of the day, creates a divergence, and what does it do? It rallies to its high right off of that for the rest of the day. And again, in this case, you would have gotten in the trade at 1140, and basically by 3 o'clock, you're more or less done for the day. Okay. Again, it keeps it very, very simple. And like I said, some of these charts at first, you guys have just been introduced to this. You're seeing it. You're kind of getting it, but it doesn't kind of fully kick in yet. Like I said, the important thing is your eyes will actually be trained within a day or two of actually looking at this. And this is why by Monday or Tuesday, you guys should be able to use this. All right, so one of the bonus rules that we focus on is we do not trade for the first 15 minutes of the day. Let the market stabilize. A lot of times, as soon as the market opens, you got all kinds of things as, as brokerage firms and hedge firms and, and, and even retail traders are coming online. They're absorbing news and a lot of things are happening in that first, you know, that first 15 minutes. The best thing to do is wait 15 minutes. So a lot of times we won't take any divergence or any signals before 10 o'clock. Okay, just to be on the safe side. Like I said, I want to make sure we give you a simple, easy strategy to trade with and not give you any, you know, potholes that can, you know, kind of throw you a curveball. Uh, Paul, the stop is always going to be on the other side, uh, the, the signal candle. Once you enter deep. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways. Now, Helen, here's here's one of the things. Okay? I'm going to cover stops in a second. I just want to focus on entry, but a lot of people are asking questions about stops. So there's a lot of different ways, but the stop is the, is the simplest one, okay? You're always going to use this signal bar for your entry as well as your stop, okay? So in this case, it's a little bit hard to see. I should probably lighten that for you. But that high green candle at 1040 in QQQ, okay? Everybody else made their highs about a half hour beforehand, hour beforehand. QQQ making its high there is where our, our entry signal is going to be, okay? You can see the red candle. There's actually four red candles that are coming down. Uh, isn't 30 minutes more significant than 15? Yeah, TJ, uh, I just want to let everybody know. So TJ asks, isn't 30 minutes more significant than 15 minutes? And I would say yes, um, depending on the day. I mean, if you have news or there's something, you know, you're absorbing something from the night before, 
I would say that use 15 minutes as a minimum, but 30 is probably a little bit safer. All right. To trade stocks, actually, a good question, BC. Um, it's actually been tested with Apple, Goldman Sachs, Google, and I. I for, I'm going to show you this, the fourth one in a second. Um, it's actually five different stocks in general that, they, that Eric has actually tested it with. Um, I don't trade it with stocks personally. Um, I just stay with the ETFs and then I trade it with options or binaries. So in this case, you can see once again, new high and the price collapsed away from it. And at no point, I mean, you were literally in the positive the entire time after the entry. Um, I would say in, in the first two minutes, you took a little bit of heat as this kind of ticked up, but at no point did it hit a stop loss. And, and you have multiple things you can trade in this case too. In this instance right here, you could have actually traded, you would have probably traded the Dow or the Qs in this one. Um, the SPY, you, you could have traded that one. Um, IWM, you could have traded. Um, there is another one, but it wasn't the high, so the signal would have actually not triggered. It would have changed it around just slightly. Here's another situation where we actually got in, but it didn't work for us. Now, depending on which one you would have picked, you would have either gotten into the trade or you wouldn't have, okay? So in this case, for me, if I'm looking for what's diversion at, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm saying, okay, SPY, okay, it's coming down. It's good, but it's not. It's just kind of breaking its lows for the day. IWM, the Russell, same thing. It's kind of at its lows for the day, but it's not quite there. Dow on the bottom right-hand corner, same thing. But if I look at the Qs, the Qs is absolutely, without a doubt, at the very, very bottom. So I'm looking for a divergence there. Now, in this case, this would have actually been a no trade. Why? It did not meet our criteria. And the reason why is because it never the, the 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 next candle okay after the, the the signal candle which would have been that large red was not broken in one candle. If it does not break in the first candle past the signal bar, you do not take it. So in this case, had we been trading QQQ, we would never even got into the trade. But had you traded any of the other three, you would have actually got in and then been stopped out about half hour later, and you would have taken excuse me a very very small loss. And again, anybody that tells you an indicator works 100% of the time is not true. And I'm, I'm okay showing you this, guys. I just want to make sure you guys know. If you're taking a loss, it's typically going to be a very, very, very tiny loss. And that's trading. And if you think that it's not, you're in the wrong business. All right. Um, do you look for entry at a certain time of day? Um, Scott, no. Actually, it doesn't matter what time of day. Obviously, during active trading hours. Um, like I said, I would suggest trading this between 8 and 10 because that's when you have the most movement. Um, at that time, you still have you know some European traders still trading. Um, the U.S. is obviously all most of our news is going around. I would say the only time that I, I personally do not trade this is if we have something like FOMC notes in the afternoon. You know, if you guys traded FOMC the last couple you know times that it's gone through, things have gotten a little bit crazy during that time period. Um, to me, it doesn't. You know, I, I typically try not to trade that late into the afternoon if I don't have to. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can actually PC. You can actually use it for some individual stocks as well. And yes, everything with with Thinkorswim is Eastern Standard Time. All right. Now, here's another situation for you. Okay. Now again, this is one that throws a lot of people off. And I've asked a few different people, look at this one and tell me where the divergence is. And they have a very hard time because when they look at all four charts, all four charts are ending all the way on the top right hand side of the chart. But if you look at it very specific, you look at 12:30. Okay. I've marked it vertically in all four charts. If you look at SPY, it's at a high for the day. Okay, now it doesn't look like it's the highest, but at that point, it's the highest of the day. If you look at QQQ, it's same thing; it's high for the day. If you look at DIA, same thing; it's high for the day. But when you look at the Russell again, Russell is definitely not at the high for the day. Okay, now in this case, we actually never got a trade signal to get in, but it's good practice to start seeing divergence. So we were we were waiting for something, but unfortunately, we never actually got a trade entry that let us in. So if you follow the rules, a lot of times. You'll see things you're like, oh, I could have got in there. I could have followed this. But if you follow the rules to the T, it'll actually save you a lot more than, than situations like this. But this is one of those ones you got to pay attention to where the highs and the lows are. And you'll see in this one, I did not mark it off with lines high and low. Always want to make sure that you do that, particularly when you first start trading it, um, particularly because you want to make sure that you, know, you can see it visually, if that makes sense. All right. Um, hold on one sec. Yeah, Helen, um, you can trade it all day long. Okay. What I find is, while you're not trading it from 8 to 10, typically you're trading this from 10 to 12. Um, you wouldn't trade it from 8 to 10 because that's before the market opens, the U.S. market opens. Being a, you know open at 9.30, you, you can kind of do some of your research beforehand. You can start marking your highs and lows, um, but you're not going to actually trade it until about 10 a.m. So it would be from more or less 10 to 12. Okay. 
All right, so here's another one. And Pac-Man just asked me to show the setup again. So here's the situation. It's the same thing, okay? Look at the Pac-Man. If you look at IWM, the Russell in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see there's a, an orange circle down there, okay? Um, what, what's happening is it's making a new low for the day, okay? If you look at SPY, it is not at the low, okay? If you look at QQQ, it is not at the low. And if you look at the diamonds, it is not at a low. So what happens? One of them is absolutely opposite, okay? So what you're doing is you're looking for divergence. Okay, we, we found divergence in this case. So then here's the entry. The entry is always going to be take the signal bar and mark the high and the low of the signal bar. Okay? The signal bar being the high or the low. Okay? And write this, actually this is the easiest thing. You're going to take the high of the low bar or the low of the high bar, if that makes sense to enter. All right? Sometimes that sounds confusing to people, but if you think about it, write it down, it'll help you. Okay? Easiest way I'd say to do this if you're confused right now is when you find that higher the low in the signal bar and it's different than the other four or the other three, put a horizontal line on the top, horizontal line on the bottom. And that you've just given yourself your entry as well as your stop for this. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. All right. So in this case, same thing. We have the low. <laughs> Rebecca, one more time. Rebecca, get a pencil and write this down. You're looking for the high of the low bar and that's your entry, or you're taking the low of the high bar. Okay, and think about that. If you have a bar up in the air, can you guys see my mouse moving around? If so, type yes. I believe that you guys can. Whoops. Okay, so I'm just going to take a. I'm just going to take one. We're just going to grab a candle. Now, this is not necessarily the actual trade setup, but see this one right down here? Okay, you guys see this red candle right here? It's got some wick on the top and wick on the bottom. Let's pretend, actually, we'll use this one over here, right past 11 o'clock. So if this is your signal bar, let's say it's the low of the day, and let's say that this is higher, this is higher, and this is higher. So your divergence is in the Dow, okay? If this is your signal bar, okay, what you're looking for to do is close above the top of the signal bar. Actually, not even close, just trade above. All right? So in this case, this large green extended range candle, it blew out the top of this signal bar, meaning it's time to get into the trade. You would buy. Your stop loss would be below the signal bar as well. So your signal bar acts as your entry as well as your exit for a stop loss. Does that make sense? Go ahead and type yes. Okay, good. Renee's got it. Good. Renee, I was... I just want to make sure you were following me there. Like I said, people think it's a lot more complicated than it actually is. And like I said, a lot of times, simple is the easiest way to do this. Now, had this been over, let's say it was over here. Say this SPY was the divergence. If you would have got in here at 207, it goes up and up. And it looks like you took a little bit hit here, but it goes up and up and up and up and up. You're grabbing at least one, two points out of this. Now, this is not a big moving day for the S&P. I'll show you some examples where it's moving 7, 8, 9, and that's where you really get some movement. But if you can grab this, and what, what is your risk? Half a point, three fourths of a point. It makes it very, very simple. Okay. Hold on one sec. Let me read this here. Yeah, actually, Max. Really, what it does best is it's not so much about clearly showing the trends. What it's doing is it it really does a, an amazing job of marking the highs and the low of every day. Okay. Um, for some reason, it, it's just interesting when we see the signals, and, and you'll you'll understand in a second. But it. it just stay with me, Max, and I'll show you in a second. So let me talk about the exits because this is what everybody wants to know. Okay, Brian, I'm in. I see it. It's easy. How do I make money on this? Where do I get out so I can take my profit? So there's a lot of different ways, and everybody has their own kind of personal approach on this one. One of them would be at support and resistance levels. Okay? Me personally, I'm not necessarily a support and resistance trader, but there's a lot of people out there that are. And why is that important? Because you're trading against those other people. You want to get out you know, before they get in All right, and, and vice versa. So support and resistance is one way to craft your exits. Another one, and this is, a, this is the one that I use a lot of times, would be opposing divergence. I'll take it in one direction, and when I see it happening against me, that's my signal for me to get out. Okay? And you'll be able to see that in a second. I'll show you the indicator that will show that to you. Another one is doing a pivot trail, and that's kind of like if you guys have ever used um, kind of like a trailing stop loss. I mean, I'm sure most of you, you guys are pretty advanced in here. So I'm sure a lot of you know what that is. Pivot trail is very simple. Okay? Another one is at the end of day. I'll show you some examples later. If you would have held this, there was no opposing divergence, no pivot trail, no support resistance in the way. But where we did take ourselves out of the trade was at the end of the day because we wanted to be, you know, not exposed overnight. Okay, I'm a very big believer. I don't like to trade things overnight because anything can happen. 
one of the things I like to do is either create a profit target for myself or I use end of day to get out of trades. And I'm a currencies trader, so for me, it's kind of, you know, there is no really end of day, but I still like to have a, a defined area, okay? Um, too many things can happen, too many strange things can happen. Uh, I know a lot of people are long-term traders and, and more power to them, but everybody's a different type of trader. And I know for me personally, you know, when I was, you know, younger in trading, I used to hold positions over the weekend and, you know, it seems like stuff always happens on the weekends and that's when you have your biggest gaps. And I just don't like having exposure to gaps. So end of, end of day profit targets are, are really kind of what I like the best, um, but also profit goals, okay? Um, Gordon, hang with me and I'll, I'll show that to you in a second again. Uh, here's another situation, and Gordon, this may help you on this one. So this actually happened two weeks ago, and this is actually when I was sitting with Eric. Um, Eric was running me through things. Uh, can you show an example of currency? Paul, actually right now, I don't have all the data for currency trading with this one because it's based off of these four. The problem with currency trading is everything is based off the dollar. So when one, when one moves, like if the dollar moves, all four of them are going to move at the same time. Okay. So this is just another tool in the shed that I use for this one. Um, if you're a currency trader, what other versions? No, this is simple. So let's, I'm going to stay on this one. So in this case, you'll see that we had divergence. Okay, we were making new highs in YM. It's obviously the top, but if you look at the other four, the ES, absolutely not at the top. NQ, absolutely not at the top. TF, absolutely not at the top. Okay, it's dwarfed. So this was a very, very easy setup. And in this case, you guys can see my mouse. See where this arrow is pointing down? That is actually the high of the day, and that is serving as your uh, signal candle. Okay, this red line that comes across, this red line is your entry. Okay, where would your stop loss be? Very simply, it's at the top of the signal candle, kind of right below this line right here, right where the uh, the red arrow is pointing. So there's your block. So did you take a little bit of heat? Yeah, and you probably got a little bit nervous. And for about 15 minutes, you were kind of a little bit negative. But then all, all of a sudden, what happened? Boom, 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 collapsed. Now you guys hopefully can see the little green dot down here. This is actually a green arrow. This is divergence in the opposite direction. So based off of my rules, what I just told you a second ago, where would I get out? I would get out at the divergence at the bottom. Okay. Now that's a pretty nice drop in, in the S and or I'm sorry, in the uh, in the Dow. Same thing. ES, same thing. You can see we also had the divergence here. Although this one, it wasn't quite at the top, so it wasn't the best of the four to choose. But you could have also chosen the, the S and P 500 in this case. And we went from 134 all the way down to 2428. So 2435, well, I'm sorry, 2433 to, you know, you're getting five points out of that one. That's not a bad day in, in 25 minutes, you know, 250 bucks, depending on, you know, how many contracts you're going to trade. Okay. So here's things to remember when you're going to trade this method. Okay. You need to be patient to wait for a divergence to play out. Okay. I find that a lot of times if you're trying to trade a strategy and you're using indicators, the first thing you want to do is you put one indicator on. And then when it doesn't work the way that you think it's supposed to work, you throw a second one on, and then you put a third one on, and then you put a fourth one on. And I can show you four indicators that will tell you that you should go long and four other indicators on the same exact chart that tell you that you should go short. There's always an indicator out there that's going to be telling you to do something. So be patient and wait for this. Don't have your eyes play games and tricks on you. Um, that's one of the biggest problems. Always enter on the break of the five-minute signal bar. As I mentioned before, some people will jump in a little bit early because it looks like such a good opportunity. But wait till you actually have that break, that one tick pass to give you that true confirmation that it's going past. Pick your exit, whether it be support, resistance, pivots. I like opposing divergence or end of day. And the key to this strategy is patience and consistency. As I mentioned before, this typically hits, and Eric has tested this for the last five years. I have not personally been trading it for five years, but Eric has. He typically gets between four and five setups every single week. It doesn't matter what week it is. He's typically getting four to five setups, and he actually doesn't trade every single week. It's typically one to two a day that he finds. Sometimes he'll have two or three. Some days he doesn't trade because he's busy. Um, like last week, he, he, he was actually not trading much last week because he was out with Jeanette in, in Phoenix enjoying that really hot, warm weather. Um, but the thing is, let it play out in front of your eyes. It's extremely simple if you follow it. Uh, does it only work for ES and YM since I can't? get TF on my thinkorswim platform. Ah, you actually can get TF, and here's why, okay? What is the difference between the TF chart and the IWM chart, Johan? The answer is there's none. So what I would do in your case, Johan, is when you have those four up there, instead of heading, having the slash TF, just put the IWM over there, and it gives you the same exact data so you can find the divergence. All right. So as I mentioned before, there's technology that is involved in this, okay? 
one of the biggest things is understanding what's happening, but then there's one that kind of, again, technology makes everybody's life easier. Um, people have asked what stocks does it work with? It has actually been tested with Apple, Amazon, Google, Goldman Sachs, and IBM. Okay, Eric actually has some data with gold and oil as well. I have personally not tested it, so I don't want to talk too much about those. Um, and I also have not tested it with the individual stocks, but he will put up Amazon, Google, Goldman Sachs, and IBM, and Apple, and trade those. Um, but like I said, I want to stay, stick to what, what I follow. Um, inside of this uh, indicator, we have a little bit of a training that goes with it. Eric actually does cover those, um, but it's not something that I do. So we have an indicator. It's a proprietary indicator that we had built. Actually, Eric had it built. He tested the system for three years and realized that I can look at charts all day, or I can pay somebody to have them program the indicator so it can show me. And that's what those those uh, the red arrows and the green arrows were. And what it does is identifies potential highs and lows for the day with a simple arrow, as well as some kind of magical pixie dust, you know, our little proprietary information. Um, as long as you follow the rules for entries and stops, which everybody should know right now, um, it, it's very, very simple to follow. And he's been testing the indicator now uh, for three years. Okay, so he's had the system for five, and he's been testing and using the indicator for three. Okay, uh, so it makes things a lot easier. You guys have seen plenty of charts today, but here's a situation. Okay, we have new highs. Um, Again, if we go back to the 10 a.m. time frame, all right, there's no line on this one to help you, but you guys should be starting to kind of visualize it at this point. If you look at the ES, it's definitely not a high, okay? If you're looking at the Russell, it's definitely not a high. If you're looking at the Dow, it's definitely not a high. But when you look at the NQ, it's definitely skyrocketed up there. Now, we've covered it a few times. You guys can see my mouse, right? If you look at this first red arrow, do we have entry into this chart? or into this trade? The answer is no. Why? It does not break below the signal candle, right? Well, we got, because of the magic sauce, we have another entry, right? Does this one break below the signal line? Yes. So your entry would have been right here, right at the bottom of this wick. And what do you do? You follow it all the way back down to the opposing divergence. And again, not a bad move, okay? 4330 down to, what, 4300, okay? And literally, that happened in, you know, a lot of people would have gotten out down here. Okay, there was a little bit of divergence here as well. But nice, simple move. And again, this is how fast this is for me. I literally will look look at the arrow, look at the other things, and say, yep, you know what? I like that one. In this case, you could have traded this a few different ways. You could have taken the futures contract on there. Um, you could have played options on this, done some daily options, or I'm sorry, some weekly options on it. Um, if anybody in this group is trading binary options, it's something that I've recently got exposed to at Nadex, and this would have been a very, very easy Nadex setup. You know, you could have done this on five minute or the, the twenty minute indexes. This would have been basically in profit in, in a matter of seconds and stayed there the entire time frame. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can actually trade these setups. All right, this was the actual trades that this is an actual live chart of what Eric was looking at, and these are the actual trades he took. Um, he actually took it a little bit differently than I did. Um, he actually took this one from over here, from about 10:15 in the morning. He saw divergence. Okay, this was at a low. This was not at a low. At this time, it was not actually a low, and this was at a low. So this was a two by two setup. Okay, so what he did is he bought uh, the future side of this. He bought ES, and he also bought some spy calls. So again, both of them on SPY on the S&P 500. And you know, with one contract, he was able to bank four hundred and twelve dollars. Okay, his options contract did even better than that. He made sixteen hundred dollars. So it's one of those things. It's very very fast. Um, when do these are print at the end of the bar? Yes, they print at the end of the bar. Okay, um, here's another situation. You'll see there's a lot of arrows on the left hand side, and, and I love showing this chart for this exact reason. You're seeing the arrows, but you're not necessarily seeing all the entries. Okay, um, there is one down here. Had you taken this one, you would have actually been stopped out, but you actually would not have taken this trade. And here's why. You have up, you have up, you have up, and you have up. There is no divergence, okay? This is where this gets fun. This is not a robot. This is not gonna trade for you. You don't sell every time you see a red arrow. You don't buy every time you see a green arrow. What you need to determine, is it a one by three, a three by one, or a two by two? And is it worth taking the trade for you, okay? In this situation, you'll see here, we had a high, and again, this may have been the high for the day. Would you have taken this one? Absolutely. It actually closed below and then collapsed. We had one up here, okay? There's so many different options to be able to take these, okay? Uh, and again, this is kind of post-fact, but I'm particularly talking about this 1300 right here, okay? Do you guys see my mouse? S&P 500 was making new highs at just over 1 p.m. in the afternoon. You'll notice at 1 p.m. over in the NASDAQ, we are not making highs. It failed to get that high. 
Russell failed to get that high. Dow, Dow was actually able to do it. So it's a two by two situation. So in this case, I really, really like this one over here. The fact that the, 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 um, the NASDAQ and the Russell failed, that really was showing me a lot. This is exactly where you would get in, right below the, below the bottom of the test. This candle here was your entry. Your stop loss would have been here and literally collapsed all the way down. We're talking about entering around 2002 with, you know, reaches down into the 1990s. Okay, we got over you know 12 points worth of movement. And again, it's another trade that Eric actually took. I always I, I like to do this too. Can you show me where the divergence is? That's where the two by two setup happens. Okay, how do we avoid a false entry? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, again, you see this, and you're like, oh my God, there's a lot of entries. I mean, if you look at these, okay, here, did it close below this test candle? No. Did it close below this test candle? No. Did it close below this test candle? Yes, it did, but it's not divergent. It was doing the same exact thing in all four frames. So you wouldn't have taken that one. So that wasn't really a false signal. Here's another signal again. Did it close below? No. Did it close below this one? Yes, but it's still on track with everything else. There's no divergence. It's doing the same thing that everything else is doing. How about this one? Now, this is where it's starting to get different. So this is coming down. This is going up. Here's your test candle. Did it close below? No. This test candle, did it close below? Yes. So you would have to determine, would I have taken this one or would I not have taken this one? So you could have been in profit at least one-to-one -one on this one. Um, had you taken this one? Um, I would not have taken this one. This is the same time as this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, and this is happening. Uh, actually, this is happening. So it's not a perfect setup in that case. Really, the only one that I like in this one is, or is right here. This is my favorite one on this entire chart because it's such clear picking the top of the day. All right? Um, can you take both ES and YM? Actually, Andre, you could take both of them um, if you wanted to take them on options. Typically, they're going to move in the same way, and it's better to have, you know, you're basically taking the same trade, so pick which one is best for you. Um, I know for me, a lot of times, as I mentioned before, you know, we actually do a, a fair amount of binary options trading now as well. What I'll do is I'll look at the premiums and where the strike prices are, you know, are placed. In this case, one of them may have been great here. It may have literally been right at 2002, but over here, it may not have been as good. I would have taken this one and just put two contracts or three contracts or you know five or ten contracts on it. So you really want to get the ideal setup. And and if I had to, if I had to pick between these two, I would have taken ES as well. I, I like that one a lot better. All right. Eric did the same thing. He shorted futures, shorted ES, was able to make 572 profit on this one. He also bought some puts. Same thing. Um, he didn't go crazy on this one with the puts, but still made another 570. It's the same trade. You know, you're mentioning that. Yeah, buy low and sell high. Yep. Yeah, I mean, basically, Renee, that's all it is. It's pick, it's it's getting help picking the tops and bottoms. Excuse me, but relying upon the other pairs to do it for you. All right. So, let me talk about the indicator. So, the indicator basically you can trade it on the four things that I mentioned, the four different asset classes, the indices. Uh, you can trade it on the ETFs if you're more of a stock trader. Uh, if you wanted to do this inside of your wealth accounts and your IRAs, you could trade that as well. Uh, you can use Google, Apple, IBM, Goldman Sachs. As I mentioned before, he has used it with gold and oil. I have personally not done that. But what it does is it's built in and it's it's done on um, it's a, it's basically an indicator for Thinkorswim and it's only for Thinkorswim right now. Um, our programmer is almost back with TradeStation, but we prefer that people go to Thinkorswim. Uh, and what it does is it kind of speeds up the process. You guys don't need the indicator if you don't want to, but what I find is a lot of people will miss them and and it really helps people get kind of ahead of the curve much much faster. Um, the strategy itself does it work? Yeah, Eric has five years of world world live trading experience on it. I don't have five years, but he's the creator, so I want to give him the credit for it. And he's been using the indicator, you know, for the last three. Now, when you purchase the indicator, you do have lifetime access to it. Um, we are constantly updating the trading videos that go along with it. Like right now, we have videos up there for a one by three and a two by two, kind of giving you the best practices, as well as a way to uh, a video on how to install the indicator, and as well as a copy of kind of a brief kind of webinar slash trading that Eric does on there. And uh, we also trade it inside of our trade room all the time. Um, oh, good question, Owen. Google, basically you put it against the other stocks. That's typically what works best. Um, they, they, they tend to follow each other just like the indexes do. All right. Um, what delta does he choose? Um, okay, I got a whole bunch of questions all, all at one time. All right, so let me go over the cost of this one, guys, because, again, I want to keep this very, very simple, and we've been here a, lot of, a long time today. So 
Um, we could probably spend hours here answering just questions on it. So um, the indicator itself, we put a value of $1,000 on there. I mean, having something that hits four to five times a week where you can make two to $500 on one contract every single day, you know, it's it's kind of hard to put a value, but we, we threw it $1,000. Um, the indicator course itself, uh, we have a value of 499 And then the actual grids, one of the things we do is instead of you trying to recreate what I just did with the four charts and setting things up, we've actually created those grids for you that have the indicators involved already. So it's as simple as you copying. If anybody, I mean, the people here that are using Thinkorswim, literally just take the, we're going to send you a link and literally take the link, paste it in, open it up, and it's there right in front of your eyes. It can't really get much more simpler than that. Um, if you are new to Thinkorswim and you open up a, a demo account and you need help with it, you can always email us at support at majorleaguetrading.com and we'll help you kind of walk you through the process. But part of the MLT indicator course itself, um, we actually have a video on how to install it for people that aren't sure. You know, a lot of people are new to Thinkorswim or, or you know, used to TradeStation or used to MetaTrader 4 and they need some help with it. So we actually have a training on how to install the indicator. Um, I know when I first started going out there and, and watching webinars and buying indicators, the first thing I did is I got it. They sent me a link and I had no idea what the heck to do with it. And when I opened it up, it never looked like anything that they had in their charts. Um, we try to make it simple. We actually send you the charts. So you just import the chart um, with like literally two, two small buttons. Uh, copy and paste, and it pops up exactly what we have in, in our in our chart sharing. So right now, if you guys go to mltclass.com, literally you can go out there and for $249 buy it. Um, and I always tell people, you know, people are like, well, is it worth $249? Well, I mean, I showed you a few different trades. Uh, if, and if there's any future traders in the room, I mean, that's literally how many, how many, you know, how many points? You're talking about five points during the day. Okay, um, this is something that I, my goal is that people will take the information that I've given you, you go out there and trade this next week. Um, I want the indicator to pay for itself tenfold, um, you know, as soon as possible. So how do you use this? Betty, that's a great question. I, I'm going to share this question with everybody. Betty wants to know how, if, since I'm a currencies trader, how do I use this indicator? Now, Betty, I said that I'm primarily a currencies trader, but just like any small business owner, if there's any entrepreneurs in this room, you're going to know that small business owners or people that are successful don't just have one source of income. They typically have multiple streams of income. While I'm a currencies trader primarily, I also do trade indexes. I also trade commodities as well. Um, what I found was a lot of the setups that I were using in the currency realm also work just fine in the stock market. And why, for me personally, stocks kind of bore me. They were just, I don't know, there was just not necessarily a challenge and things were slow. Like I said, if you heard me earlier, I said I don't actually, I, I don't personally find much reason to trade stock. I would trade options on there. I can't find many reasons why. Anybody would want to use a non-leveraged asset class when we have leveraged asset classes with you know fixed losses in them um, that we you know we know our maximum kind of loss going in. So for me, I, I literally spend most of my time now looking at currency charts, and what I'm trying to do is incorporate ways that I can trade safer and trade more profitable. So what I did is when I got access to this, and I you know I sat down with Eric, uh, much like Jeanette did, and Eric taught me this divergence. What I said was, you know what, this is just another arrow in my quiver. This is another way for me to go. I have, I literally have my chart up with my, you know, my grid there with my four charts, and all I'm doing is I'm looking for that red arrow or green arrow. And when I look at it, I'll stop looking at the currency chart. I'll look across. And recently, the last three, four weeks, what I've been doing is I say, okay, that's great. I'm actually in the process of building a, a binary options class as well. I'll look at it and say, you know what? I got, I got a two by two or a one by one. What can I see over on this side? Up oh, there we go. You know what? I'm going to place those trades. And then I go back to what I was doing, you know, or I go out and, you know, for the summer, I'm also daddy daycare. So I have my seven year old twins and, and they're playing lacrosse. But what I do is I use technology to my advantage. I'll have it set an alert. I'll have it email me. Um, I'll look for the red arrows. So I'm going to basically do everything. Um, can this work in Forex? Baringer, I am actually testing it right now and getting some data and it's a little bit early to release it for, for currencies. Um, but I will tell you, I do have some promising results with it. All right. So you got to hold up. Hold up on that one. And what I would say is if you're a currencies trader and you want to really use this for currency trading, the first thing that I would do is I would open up TradeStation. I'm sorry, I would open up Thinkorswim, um, whether it be a demo or a live account, and spend the $249, get this indicator and practice with it. And then when we can release the actual currency data and the settings for currencies, you're already familiar with the indicator, you're comfortable with the entries and comfortable with the exits, um, and then you can go from there. I'm in the UK. Okay. Yeah, we, we, have, we have traders from all around the world um, that are actually using this. So that, that makes sense why you want currencies because you're in the UK. All right, so what do you do next? Um, this is a big thing. Everybody's like, this is easy. I like this. I can make money next week. And as I said, my goal is you guys will take this and you'll make money with it next week. Um, I can't guarantee that, obviously, because I'm not trading with you, um, but I hope that you do. Um, I want you to load that divergence indicator, and upon purchasing it, you'll go to the website. You'll receive a link. 
there's a video that shows you how to install it. So even if you don't have Thinkorswim, go out there, get a demo of Thinkorswim. Go watch the video. It'll tell you how to import it. And if you've never used it, you'll start seeing it visually, and you'll be able to use it on whatever you know platform that you trade on. Um, you can also review the introductory videos, the one by three and the two by two that is up there. You can memorize the trade setups. Um, start reviewing for the you know the previous day session. Kind of look back at the last week and see what's hit, what didn't hit, what you would have traded. A lot of times you can learn from that, um, and then really prepare for the next trading day. You know. This is something that the markets need to be live, hence why I didn't go out and start going through charts with you. But Monday morning, what I would start doing is start looking at charts. At 10 a.m., if you've already had the indicator and you've watched the training videos on it, start looking at trades. And again, if you're taking very, very tiny risk, I mean, think about it. If you're buying a weekly, you know, let's say you know you know how to trade options and you're buying an at the money, right? You're buying an at the money put or call. How much is it going to cost you? And if something moves against you a very, very tiny bit, how much is that option going to change? Okay? So again, those are there's Plenty of simple, easy ways for you guys to start preparing and trading this. All right. Now, here's two quick setups before we finish up. Um, here's a here's one literally from two weeks ago. Okay. This one I've tried to make it even easier for you to see. Okay. You can see the gray boxes out there. All right. This one is simple because the gray boxes. You have the ES on the top left hand side. Is it making lows for the day? Yes. But if you're looking at the chart, is it the low on the chart? No, it's not. Okay. If you look at IWM, the Russell, same thing. It's not coming back to where the opening was for the day. If you're looking at the NQ, it's abs excuse me, it's absolutely filling that gap and it's coming all the way back down again. YM, same thing, stuck at the top. The entry would have been here. The start of this uh, orange line right here, this green candle right here. Now again, did we get an entry here? No. Did we get an entry here? No. Did we get an entry here? Nope. Why? Because the, the, the candle after did not go above it. What about here? Absolutely. This candle start closed and went right back up again. So it literally picked the bottom of the day and then price continued to move. Now for me, I would have probably taken myself out of the trade right here, made a nice little profit on that trade, whether it be you know with a standard option or a futures contract. Um, but it's a nice way to be able to pick it. And again, price ended a high for the day. And most people would have had nothing to do with this when it came back down to fill the gap. All right. And this is the only one that actually did it. On Thursday the 22nd, literally two days ago when I was finishing the slides, this shows you how small your risk actually can be. Okay, This was a high of the day. Nobody else had highs for the day at this moment in time at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Everybody was kind of over here, but I wanted to blow it up so you guys can see it. This bottom dotted line, there's my entry. Why? Because here is my signal bar. Where's my stop? Literally right above the signal bar. Now, it got really, really close. People would have got scared, but it never actually went above. It's actually slightly higher. Okay, It was close, though. Okay, and people are like, ooh, but it wasn't. Now again, thirty-seven dollars risk. You may have, you know, you may have added a little bit more to make it an even fifty. Okay, in this case, it dropped back down again. Is risking thirty-seven dollars and fifty cents worth it for three hundred and fifty dollars profit? And now I used an end of the day target here. Absolutely. Okay. Now, whether you trade it or not is entirely up to you. Be safe with it. Don't trade money that you don't have. Um, but if you haven't already, go to mltclass.com to purchase and download it. Um, like I said, as soon as you uh, complete the purchase, you'll actually be given another offer that we have for our um, traders that are in this webinar. Um, $7, you can actually get access to our trade room for the next 30 days. And what that does is you'll actually see them using this as well as some of our other strategies. And it's a great way to get introduced to who Major League Trading is, um, seeing us live in action. Now this week, if you guys do join this week, it will be a little bit slower. Um, Jack and Eric, the two founders of Major League Trading, are taking their first vacation in two and a half years. We kind of made them go. Um, We've had such great success, and they've been so busy in their, their their workhorses, so we made them take some vacation this week. So it will be a little bit slower this week, but the week after, um, they'll, be, they'll be right back again. So um, this may be new for some of you guys. Some of you may already be members of Major League Trading, and you know what we have in there. Uh, but like I said, this is just really scratching the surface of what we do, and this is a simple strategy. It's something that everybody can trade. Um, Bringer, keep with us. Uh, like I said... <laughs> It does work for everything. You can use whatever platform you have. Um, if you're using one of the other ones overseas, you're going to have to manually draw it. And the indicator doesn't work there, but we are creating um, the indicators for everybody else. So with that being said, that is the conclusion of the slide presentation. Um, let me see. Expected profit using options. Yeah, Andre, it's going to depend on what option you use. As you know, options have a lot of moving pieces. Um, you will have um, – there's so many different pieces to it. Um, whether it be a weekly option, a monthly option, what week it is, you know, there, there's so many moving pieces. It'd be hard to say what your profit is. Um, like I said, one of the things I've mentioned a few times that I'm really starting to get into and really, really enjoy is the binary option aspect of it. And binaries, you have 20 minutes, you have every two hours, you have one that ends at the end of the day. Um, and, and 
I've been using a lot of I've been using this strategy with a lot of 20 minute and end of day uh, binary contracts. And literally for a binary, it needs to go one penny past where you want it to be. So in a lot of these cases, you can sell it for you know 40 bucks, 50 bucks, and you're making 50 dollars on it in 20 minutes um, per contract. And you know you make a quick 500 bucks in 20 minutes um, using a lot of the a lot of these strategies. And I have in the last you know two weeks. So it all depends on when you do. Um, is trading mostly counter trend? Yeah, Robert, a lot of people like to take this and have this be like a continuation trade, but that's not what it's designed for. It's literally designed to find when something's wrong in the market. Um, and, and a lot of times it will pick the top. Typically when things are raging forward, up or down, they're always going to come back again. And it plays on the retracements of the market. There's always going to be certain indexes or even, it doesn't matter what we're trading. There's always going to be some things that are stronger or weaker. This is to take advantage of those, those strengths and weaknesses, uh, particularly when you have something that makes an all-time high, like a, a new high, and nothing else can. It's going to retrace back again, and the weaker one is always going to fall faster, and vice versa. The stronger is always going to, you know, propel higher when you know things turn, and that's what this is attempting to do. Um, there's a lot of trend-following strategies out there. Um, this is more kind of a, I'd say it's more counter. All right. So with that being said, I can turn it back over to Jeanette. Um, I can hang around. If you guys have any questions, um, you can message support at majorleaguetrading.com. And because you guys are so great and you guys had a lot of great questions, if you guys do want to reach me uh, directly, you guys can message Brian at majorleaguetrading.com. Um, give me, you know, if I don't answer instantaneously, it's because I do have a lot of stuff going on, but I'll do my best to answer any of the questions you guys have. Um, I know it's been a long day for many of you, and thank you. Jeanette put on a great group, and we've had some great speakers today. Um, and I'm really, you know, pleased. And we actually are going to be in Chicago. So if anybody is going to the Chicago event, uh, Jack is actually going to be there. And Jack has some really, really amazing things that he's going to cover. I, I don't want to kind of steal his thunder, but uh, he's got some new stuff that we're releasing in Chicago. So make sure you make it out to Chicago if you can. And that's all I have. Uh, actually, OM, yes, the answer is yes, you can.